Okay. Uh, all right, so let's get started on our, our final day here. So what, we, uh, what we're going to do today, so what we did yesterday, oh, so uh, before I get started, uh, I've, I've, as you might have seen, I'm, I've been posting the notes up there. I've also been posting homework assignments. I haven't, uh, I, I didn't post the homework assignment yesterday, so I'll post both homeworks three and four uh, uh, after class. So I just hadn't, I hadn't finished writing it yesterday, and then I got hung up doing other things. But uh, uh, so those will both be available uh, uh, by this evening. Okay, so just get them from this website. All right. So what are we going to do today? So we are going to uh, uh, continue on with our little segment on kind of like the, the mathematical fundamentals of, of compressive sensing. Uh, but the nature of what we're going to do today is actually very different uh, than, what, than what we did yesterday. So yesterday, you know, we had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, still going to be about recovering uh, uh, under the terminal system. But yesterday we spent a lot of effort in trying to say, okay, look, you know, when can we solve a problem like this uh, uh, using L1 minimization? So the problem is, like, you know, the, the vector on the right there is sparse, uh, and I observe it through an underdetermined matrix. Uh, then the question is, is like, you know, what properties do I need uh, out of this matrix to be able to perform that recovery uh, using L1? And so, uh, uh, you know, in particular, we looked at several different cases, but, you know, in particular, what we looked at is said, okay, uh, you know, if this matrix has the uh, restricted isometry property for, for vectors, which are, say, 3S sparse, then this, 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 uh, optimization program, you know, the exact solution uh, uh, is the, exactly the sparse vector. And then we showed in a couple different ways that, you know, it's also stable, right? And so the main elements of that analysis uh, uh, it had a lot to do with, uh, it's almost like, it was almost like geometrical, right? So it was a lot of linear algebra, but really it was all sort of linear algebra motivated by this kind of geometrical picture we had in mind and trading off, you know, the fact that if we have a, a, a descent vector, that means that that defector, the vector must have certain geometrical properties, and then conflicting that against the fact that you know this vector would also have to be in the, uh, the null space of phi, and, and uh, uh, what that means in, in terms of the uh, 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 approximate isometry, or restricted isometry condition. Okay, so what we do today, you know, then we can, that kind of leaves the natural question of so well. You know, how do I know that a matrix phi has this property? And so that's what we're going to uh, talk about today. So almost from top to bottom, we're going to sort of uh, uh, establish kind of like another one of these, these foundational results uh, in this area of study. And that's uh, if I select a matrix at random uh, in a certain way, and this class, what we'll mean by a certain way, is I simply fill the matrix with IID, uh, Gaussian random entry. Uh, then with high probability, it's going to obey this, this uh, uh, restricted isometry property for all 2s sparse x, when the number of rows looks like uh, s times a logarithmic factor. Okay, so this is a, a, a nice result. Uh, it kind of gives us everything we need to know to talk about, you know, sparse recovery through, through random matrices. But more importantly, I mean, there's some uh, uh, very nice things we'll see, right? I mean, so the first nice thing is like, uh, you know, it's going to take us maybe close to an hour to, to go through why this works. Uh, but it's not in the end that hard. Like, really all we need is just some basic things from, from, from probability there. We just need to put them together in the right way. Uh, the other thing that, that it does is it, it's kind of, you can kind of see like uh, uh, other properties of random matrices or why random matrices are kind of interesting, right? Because like, remember, like another way we, we interpret, oops, we interpret this, this kind of, uh, this kind of statement is, uh, you know, I can, I can either think of it as preserving energy for a 2s sparse vector, or I can think of it as preserving the distances between all s sparse vectors, right? And so uh, in some sense, you know what we're kind of saying here is the these 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 the, the, that uh, when I sucks this collection of things to a random matrix, it's in some sense geometry is preserved, 
Okay, uh, and that's kind of a concept which, which can be generalized past just uh, uh, two as sparse vectors. Uh, we'll touch on it again in the second lecture today when we talk a little bit about low rank recovery. Uh, and, you know, it can also be uh, 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 extended to different types of sets of vectors that are not just the class of 2S sparse vectors. Okay, so I will say that, you know, we're proving that this is true is easier than it looks at first. It's just, again, pulling together a bunch of easy results from probability theory. Okay, so uh, remember, like, you know, uh, the, the type of the uh, uh, ideal, oh, I should mention one last thing, too. So, you know, really what we told, we'll really prove today is something for Gaussian random matrices. Uh, the stuff that we'll do, the steps that we take, you know, it's actually not that hard to extend it to uh, other types of distributions. I mean, the, the type of argument we'll make is, is crafted for matrices which have IID random variables as their entries. Uh, but uh, the fact that they're Gaussian only plays a small role in the, in the analysis. It really is easy, uh, easier to, easy to extend. Okay. So, uh, you know, remember, this is, this is interesting just because, like, you know, random matrices have been used in acquisition. And one example is this, this idea of the Rice single pixel camera, which we talked about a couple times already. Okay. So, here's the, 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 the basic idea. What we want to show, or one, you know, one thing to realize is, okay, each entry of this matrix is an IID, uh, a random variable. We, to normalize things in the right way, you know, we, we say each entry has, uh, is Gaussian with zero mean and has variance 1 over m. Right? So making the variance 1 over m just kind of makes the normalization work out. Let's see, we can see why for a second. All right, so our first thing we do is just Let's just look at what happens if we just fix a vector on the right. right? So basically what we want to do now, remember, is we want to say, okay, if I take uh, any uh, uh, 2S sparse vector here and send it through this matrix, I kind of want the energy over here to be comparable to the energy over here. Right? That's the goal of the end of the day. Okay, so you know, what the first thing to realize is, first easy thing to realize is, you know, if this is just some fixed vector, this vector x is just something fixed, uh, and this is full of IID uh, random numbers, then each entry of y is just the sum of Gaussian random variables. Right? And so, of course, uh, a sum of Gaussian random variables is itself a Gaussian random variable. And not only that, the, you know, the, uh, since these are IID, the, uh, uh, those Gaussian random variables are uh, independent. And so I can compute the variance of y just by summing up the variances of all the, you know, the, the different entries of the, in the uh, uh, pointwise multiplication of a row of phi and x, right? And so since uh, <clears throat> uh, each, each entry in, in phi has a variance of 1 over m, you know, what I get when I add up those variances is I get the sum of the square, and so, and so when I multiply it by an entry in x, you know, the variance becomes the magnitude of that entry of x squared divided by m, and so when I sum that up, what do I get? I get the energy in x divided by m. Right? And so basically just because these, these, you know, the entries are Gaussian, that means the measurements will be Gaussian. And instead of the variance being 1 over n, it's just the norm squared. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, the energy in x uh, uh, divided by m. Okay, so and then it's kind of easy to see that, you know, if I look at... Uh, 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 I mean, so if I can comp compute, okay, what's the sort of energy in y, right? So this is the energy in phi x, 2 squared, right? So this is the sum of the entries of y squared, right? And so the expectation of this is just the sum of the expectation of the ym squared, Right, and we saw that was x squared over m, so of course this is just going to be the two norm of x squared. Okay, so it's somehow it's like, you know, that's the first easy thing. It's like we, we want, like I said before, we kind of want the energy on this side to match the energy over here. So at least it does, it's easy to see that it does an expectation. Right? And again, that just simply follows from the fact that uh, uh, these, the, the, the ym themselves are, are, are Gaussian with... with uh, uh, IID Gaussian with, with this variance. Okay, so that's something. So what we need, I mean, a lot more than that. I mean, what we, what we want to say is, okay, one thing, if I have a random variable, 
its expectation is 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 some is you know the norm of x squared. What I really want to show is that this is going to be close to x squared in some more meaningful way. Right? I mean, I can have a random variable that has expectation. It can still take values pretty far away from the expectation. So really what I want to say, say is that, look, this not only does this have the right mean, but it doesn't deviate too far from its mean. So that's really where a lot of the effort comes in, we, uh, comes in here. Okay, so that's the next thing uh, that, uh, that we want to do. Basically, we want to show that uh, this random variable is it's very tightly clustered around its expectation. And uh, that, not only that, you know, what we're going to see is that clustering gets tighter and tighter uh, the larger that M gets. Okay, so that's, you know, the, the, the first kind of main step. So here's the, here's the, the uh, you know, what we'll see. We'll say, okay, not only is that expectation, but if I say, okay, what's the probability that the energy in the measurement deviates from the energy in the original signal, uh, the probability that this deviation is less than, say, say delta, and just say the norm of x is equal to 1. So say the probability that this is less than delta, this goes, you know, uh, uh, is extremely close to 1. Right? And that, if, uh, you know, just like I said, the probability of that exceeding delta times x squared is going to be something like e to the minus m delta squared uh, uh, divided by e. Right, so as you know, delta, you know, remember we're interested in kind of uh, what we'll see at the end of the day is this delta is going to be something like our Sonica constant. This is going to be something like a constant. It's going to be like a, a half or a quarter or something. So really what we see here is we get like an e to the minus constant times m. So that gets small really quickly as m goes to zero. Right, so that, I'm sorry, as m gets large. So even for moderate size m, you know, this probability will be very, very close to one. Right, but we're gonna we're gonna need it to be very close to one. So. <clears throat> okay, so that this this is the first thing kind of we want to establish this exact result. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, well, let's just skip that part. Here's here's what we can say. Okay, uh, let's so let's just state this as a theorem. But it's really you know just some, something we can we can go through quite easily. So. If phi is an n by n matrix whose entries are i and e Gaussian, the first thing we've seen is that sort of the expectation of this output uh, uh, net energy is equal to x squared. Um, you know, we just prove that just like we do here. Then the second thing we'll show uh, is that for any uh, delta between 0 and 1, kind of the, again, the probability that this exceeds delta, and let's say that uh, in this case, uh, we're just making the assumption that the, uh, that the norm of x is equal to 1. Let me just write that explicitly. I should have wrote that on the slides, but, because it doesn't matter. Uh, since everything, I mean, clearly this will all scale with, with, with uh, uh, x if we choose to make it not norm 1. Okay, so then what we'll show now is that the sort of the probability that this difference between you know, the energy and the, the measurements that I make and the uh, energy in the original signal, the probability that exceeds delta, basically that goes to like e to the minus delta squared uh, times m. So it gets small as, really quickly as m uh, gets big. Okay, so let's, how do we show something like this? Right, it's, uh, you know, this is a, uh, right, so what's random here? This is the random variable, v, because, you know, v equals phi x, and phi is the thing that's random. Uh, it's not, you know, it's a function of all the different random variables that are inside of phi. So we have to sort of treat this very carefully. And always remember that this is, you know, its mean. This is the mean of that, uh, that random variable. Okay. So all we need is a, you know, a quote-unquote tail bound for this uh, uh, random variable, which is the energy in phi times x. Okay. Uh, here's the main tool that you use. It's an uh, uh, easy thing called the Markov Inequality. So again, it's just, it's, you learn this in any undergraduate probability course. And all it says is, you know, there's an easy, the easiest way to get a tail bound on, say, a positive random variable. Uh, if I want to say that the probability that y is bigger than t, so just say y is, it doesn't matter what the distribution is, other than that, that we are sure that y is always positive. So y is uh, greater than zero with probability equal to one. So I can immediately say the problem that y is bigger than t is less than the expectation of y over t. Right? It's the simplest tail bound uh, in the world. In fact, you can prove it extremely quickly. 
Right? And all you have to do is say, okay, here's the definition of expectation of a positive random variable. Right? I can say the integral goes from zero to infinity. Of course, that's going to be bigger than if I stop this integral at some point t. Right? And then, you know, everywhere inside this integral, uh, y is bigger than t. So again, this is going to be bigger than if I just made this y a t everywhere and pulled the t outside. So now I'm just integrating the density from t to infinity. And what is this with just the probability that y is bigger than t? Right? So it's like a, you know, a little four-line proof that you've probably seen before. But it really gives us our starting point for saying, OK, look, you know, we're interested in, in bounding. Uh, we're interested in a, in a positive random variable. Uh, you know, what's one thing we can say? Well, we can say the probability that that you know, random variable is bigger than t, it's less than its expectation uh, uh, divided by t. OK, that's good. And you know, what's interesting about this, or what's powerful about this, is two things. Uh, first is there's almost no assumptions here. Right? All we said is y is positive. It has nothing to do you know, with the distribution uh, of y at all. Uh, the second thing is that this is true for any t that I want. Right? So it gives me a lot of flexibility in uh, uh, how to apply this. OK, so that's, that's you know, really, that's kind of where this tail bound is going to come from. This is going to come from this uh, uh, manipulating this Markov inequality. So once you have this, you can actually go, you actually know a lot of things. So I know that, you know, if y is bigger than t, I know the probability that y is bigger than t, that's the same as the probability that y squared is bigger than t squared. I can square both sides. I can apply any monotonic function to both of these things, or vertical function to both of these things, and not change the probability at all. Right? But if I look at this, I can sort of immediately get kind of a new relation. So I can say, look, look, the probability of y is bigger than t, that's equal to the probability of y squared is bigger than t squared. I've done the square what's inside here. But I have another ground, too. I can say, well, that's less than the second moment divided by t squared. And I can do y cubed, or y to the 5, or you know, y whatever. I can use anything I want here. And in fact, it doesn't have to be polynomials. I can even use any function. So I can you say you use e to the lambda y for any lambda bigger than 0 is greater than e to the lambda t. It's actually exactly the same as this. You know, all I've done is say this is all these statements, all these things on the left here, these are exactly the same as saying the probability of y is bigger than t. But these things on the right here, they could be quite different. Right? So I actually have a library of bounds uh, 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 from which I can choose. In fact, I can get one for any monotonic you know, phi that I wish. Okay, so this is kind of a standard trick. Uh, uh, in probability theory. Uh, and, you know, what you use at the end of the day, it's, you know, what, what, what we'll use is something like this, and it's, uh, it's called a turnoff bound. It has a special name. So all this is is just a special instantiation of the Markov inequality. Uh, and, as again, you just sort of raise each of these, it's the same as raising each of these things as e to the uh, uh, lambda y and e to the lambda t for any lambda bigger than zero. Okay, so why do we want something like this? Well, remember, like, what we're interested in is we're interested in this norm of the measurements, right? And the norm is the sum of a bunch of measurements squared, and if the rows of this matrix are independent, it's going to be a sum of independent random variables, right? And so what, you know, why we like bounds like this is once I write y as a sum of independent random variables, right, what does that mean? It means I can sort of separate that sum as a product of e's, and since they're independent, I can take the expectation of each one individually. And that's going to give me some leverage uh, to do what I want to do. Okay, so this is, you know, again, we're going to be interested in the positive random variable. And this is how we can sort of talk about how big, in a very quantitative way, uh, a positive random variable is. Okay, uh, that's good. So here's, you know, let's, what, now let's just take this as a general result. And here's how we're going to apply it. So we have uh, uh, b is, is equal to phi x. Uh, you will, again, always assume that the uh, uh, two norm of x is equal to 1. Uh, you know, we can always write the probability that b squared is bigger than 1 plus delta. This is, again, we're just plugging in to here. So e to the minus lambda norm of b squared. So this is the sum of the energy in the measurements, y. Uh, and the bottom is just e to the lambda, whatever here. And this is, you know, this lambda, it's true for all lambda bigger than zero. So we'll just have to pick a lambda at the end of the day. But we'll, we're going to defer on that uh, for now. Okay, that's what we have. So what do, what do we do? Well, 
it's not that much to do. All we do is say, okay, look, norm of the measurements is just the sum of the entries squared. Okay, we know that if we have e to the sum, I can write that as a product of e's. And not only that, this, so this is the you know, magnitude of the first measurement squared, magnitude of the second measurement squared, magnitude of the nth measurement squared. Uh, and I know that since they're independent, right, uh, I can basically take this expectation, so this is a product of functions of independent random variables. I can, of course, separate an expectation of a product of functions of independent random variables into the product of the expectations of those functions by themselves. Right, so if these are independent, it's fair game to, to write this. Right, and not only that, I mean, that they're, they're, they're independent, they're also identically distributed. Right, the, uh, each, each VI, so each V1 is Gaussian with uh, 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 variance, uh, the norm of uh, 1 over M in this case, since the norm of X is equal to 1. Uh, but I mean, you're right, okay? So, so we, I mean, so we know what it is, uh, in other words. Okay, so now, uh, since it's IID, really all we need to do is compute, you know, what this quantity is. Okay, so uh, here is, you know, here's where we are. So we do, do, do all these manipulations, and then yeah, here's, here's where we stand. So we have, you know, we want to establish a bound like this. We have a bound. We kind of want to make sense of this, this right-hand side. And so what we can say is, like, look, the probability of this exceeds 1 plus delta is... The expectation of e to the minus lambda v1 squared, where v1 is a normal random variable with variance 1 over m, that to the mth power over e to the lambda times 1 plus delta. Okay, so that's good, and all we did was just do some basic probability theory to get here. So now the question is, is like, what's on, what is that on top? So if v1 is, is Gaussian, what is v1 squared? Yeah, it's chi squared, right. So then when I take an expectation of e to the lambda times some random variable, what is that called? That entity. Like, uh, you know, have you heard of the moment generating function? This is the moment generating function for, for v1 squared. So, I mean, my point here is that, uh, okay, so, right, so like, e of, so if you don't know this, it's good. This has a special name, this is called the moment generating function for x. Uh, the reason it's called that is because if you, you know, to, to, to take derivatives of this thing and, and evaluate them at lambda equals to zero, those give you the moments of uh, uh, the random variable x. That's just a fact. Uh, and, you know, we take lambda is like j times omega. It's the characteristic function of the random variable. It's the Fourier transform of its uh, uh, density function. Okay, but yeah, so like, uh, uh, but look, at the end of the day, what is this? It's a special thing, uh, the chi-squared distribution we know about. So at this point, you can just go to Wikipedia and type in chi-squared distribution and look for a moment-generating function, and then here's your answer, right? So then you say, okay, that's just what I'm going to plug in, right, for this guy right here, right? So we just do that. So this is, a, again, my point here is this is a quantity which is known. It's known, and so it's, it appears in a chart in Wikipedia, so that we can assume is known. So I take this, and that's what, it go, what, that's what I plug in for that guy. Okay, so that gives me this, right? So I'm starting to manipulate this into something which, uh, 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 which is going to be uh, uh, reasonable in a time. So like what, what I can say is, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I want to get something which looks like e to the minus n here. Uh, and then that, that's what I'm starting to do. Okay. So now we just have to manipulate this thing a little bit more. So this, this one thing to say is this moment interface, this is holds true for any uh, lambda that's bigger than, uh, less than m over 2. Okay, so this is what we have now. Like, this is our bound. And now what we need to do is uh, let's just choose a value of lambda. And, you know, what we're going to do is we're not even necessarily going to choose the best one. We're just going to choose one that makes the expression simpler, right? And so, what can I choose to make this simpler? Well, let me choose uh, let me choose something that kind of makes this uh, uh, this exponent much easier to understand. So, I'm just going to choose a lambda that's like m over one plus two delta uh, one plus delta times two is what you take. So, you just plug that in there. Uh, 
the nice thing about this is we're guaranteed that this value of lambda is always going to be less than m over 2, just because we have delta over 1 plus delta times a half, multiplying m here. And then when I plug that in, it, get, it gets all, things get a lot nicer. So when if I, this happens, if I plug this value in, what do I get out? I get out something which looks like this. The probability, that, again, that the energy of this measurement is bigger than 1 plus delta. This is, looks like you know, e to the minus delta m over 2, but times 1 plus delta times m over 2. So we kind of just want to turn this into the e to the minus something. So you know, whenever you have that, you just sort of turn to Taylor series. So here's what you could say. So here's a, a you know, what we're going to do is we're just going to take this 1 plus delta, and we're just going to re replace it by this complicated exponent. And what gives us the right to do that? Well, this complicated exponent thing is always bigger than this blue line. So this blue line for uh, 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 fixed, well, for any delta, this is what 1 plus delta looks like as a function of delta. All right, this is what e to the delta minus delta squared minus delta cubed through. This is what this looks like as n plus delta. Right? So this isn't an accident. What I'm doing is trying to match it as closely as possible down here for small values of delta. You just get this by doing Taylor series expansion of this uh, uh, quantity and truncating it after some point. Okay, so then, you know, what that's going to give us, once we replace this 1 plus delta with this red stuff here, it's going to just give us an exponential, right? And so I plug that in, this first delta goes away, cancels with that, uh, and the, uh, uh, the rest of it looks like this. Okay, so that's what we have, right? So now we have something that, 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 that we can deal with. So I want to say, like, uh, uh, you know, if I want to say, if I have, so it, it's actually, it says something very nice. So it's like if I have a, a, a m by n matrix and I apply it to any fixed vector, right? This had nothing to do with x, rather than, but just that x had norm 1, right? And so then I know an expectation, the norm of those measurements is going to be equal to 1. Okay, that's good. How close to 1 is it? Well, let's say the probability is bigger than 3 halves, right? That's going to look... Uh, so if I use like delta is a, a half here, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like a fourth uh, minus an eighth. So an eighth, it's going to look like e to the minus m over 32, right? Something like that. So if m is like a couple thousand, right, that probability is going to be really small. But most importantly, what this did is it gives me kind of a, 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 a way to qualitatively think about how this probability tightens as uh, uh, m gets big, right? So as m gets larger, I can choose delta to be smaller, honestly, and, uh, uh, and keep this, this, this uh, uh, probability fixed. Okay. Right, and if importantly, I can make delta, you know, kind of go like the square root of that, one over the square root of m, and keep the probability fixed. That's one way to think about it. Okay, so that's nice uh, 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 result. So... The, that's an upper bound. That's a probability that doesn't exceed. You can also get a, a lower, uh, lower bound and using almost exactly the same sequence of steps. So you do everything exactly the same. You choose just a different probability of lambda. You use a different kind of Taylor series expansion. You get almost the same thing. Okay, so that's good. So that tells you, you know, something which might even be kind of interesting outside of uh, 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 this world of compressed sensing. It says if I apply a random matrix to a vector, the first thing it says, it doesn't matter what that vector is, right? In some sense, you know, if we, if we go all the way back uh, here, right, these measurements, the distribution, it only depends, the variance is the only thing that depends on x, and that's the only, the only thing that uh, the, the role x plays here is it's the uh, norm of x squared, right? So in some sense, the distribution of these measurements is independent of the ve input vector. Right? And so that means that like, it doesn't really matter. It's completely isotropic. It doesn't really matter what I feed this thing. Uh, I get the same sort of answer out. Okay, that's good. So what's a nice kind of application result? So this, uh, the, uh, this result. So this sort of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this work, you know, the, almost, the, you know, this derivation of this stuff, I actually didn't base this on any paper from the field of compressed sensing. Actually based it uh, from a, a proof in an introductory chapter to a book from theoretical computer science, right? So this idea of uh, uh, energies or distances being preserved as they get uh, 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 sucked through a, uh, a ma random matrix—it's kind of an old one to uh, 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 computer scientists, 
right? And so here's, here's uh, uh, the kind of a, what's known as the Johnson Lindenstrauss lemma. So it's a, a, a classical lemma. And uh, what it says is, look, if I have an arbitrary set of uh, points in Rn, so an arbitrary set of vectors, uh, then, you know, what you can say, well, the way that they was originally said, it was there exists a mapping such that, you know, uh, if I apply, uh, 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 if I put every one of these vectors through this mapping, so this mapping, uh, uh, you know, maps n variables to n variables, then I can preserve the distance between all pairs of points in this set uh, to within uh, uh, some resolution delta with probability epsilon, you know, when the sort of logarithm of the number of uh, uh, dimensions that I reduce to uh, is on the order of the number of rows. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's just kind of look at that a little more carefully. So what have, I, what have we said here? So for this result, we say, okay, look, for any one fixed vector, Right, I, I'll preserve the energy to uh, 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 with pro to within delta with probability one minus two e to the minus some constant delta squared times n. So then, if I want to talk about preserving the energy between k different points, so like uh, x one, x two, x k, it's easy to just take this and uh, uh, just should say two k. This should, uh, you know, we can just say, uh, look, if I want, you know, all of these, to, uh, so this bound the whole for all these uniformly, what I do is I just multiply the failure probability by k. So I start 2k e to the minus delta squared m over n. Okay, so then how does that relate to this? So now if I have, uh, say, q different points, and what I want to do is I want to preserve all the distances between those points. What I can do is I can look at the sort of Q squared, or the really the Q choose two sets of differences between those those vectors, right? And I can say, you know, how many, uh, and so we'll just we'll just call that Q squared, even though it's like Q times Q plus one over two. Uh, and so then I can ask, like, okay, like how, you know, what do, what's the probability I preserve the distances uh, to within delta for all these different pairs of arbitrary vectors? Well, I, you know, I just take this part, and I just multiply that by Q squared, basically. Uh, so you have this. So then you can say, like, look, if I want this probability of failure to be less than epsilon, you know, how big do I need to make the, the dimension, uh, the number of rows, to embed these Q different points? So how big do I have to make M versus Q? Well, it turns out that basically what M has to be, once I flip this expression around, it just has to look like log Q over delta squared. So that means if I have, you know, it doesn't, what's interesting here is it doesn't depend on the ambient dimension n at all. So if I have like a, you know, a huge number of points in Rn, and n could be arbitrary, it's like R1 million. I have these, you know, thousand points in R1 million. And I want to preserve all the distances between them. I can actually dr dr dramatically reduce the dimensionality of that. I can map those, those, those vectors from R1 million down to something like log, uh, R log 1 million. Right, so you can reduce the dimension by an exponential factor and still preserve all the distances. Like, it's a very important thing, because then it's like, you know, if you have like complicated database records, which have, you know, a million entries in them, actually it says if I'm going to talk about, you know, seeing how close those points are to one another, do nearest neighbor, I can do nearest neighbor in this compressed space uh, with almost the same accuracy. I pay this accuracy delta, uh, just by taking a random projection. And of course, there's some failure. There's some probability, there some chance your random projection just makes a mess of everything. But that chance is small. Like it shows up, you know. I have to, as, as excuse me, I can control epsilon, and the, you know, I have to pay a little bit of a penalty for the smaller of an epsilon. But it looks like log one over epsilon. So that's nice. So again, and again that's you know, the, the sort of fundamental result from theoretical computer science. It just talks about keeping points in R and separated when I do dimensionality reduction. And all we needed to, 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 to do this was, you know, we just talked for 20 minutes about Markov inequality and turnoff bound. It really just all falls, follows from exactly that. Okay. Uh, that's good. So, uh, right, so here's the kind of picture you have in mind. You have Q points in Rn, and I embed them into a subspace, you know, even in this case, a subspace of dimension M, and the dimension of that subspace you know, if I, if, if, if I really only want to, say, preserve the distances within a factor of 10, it has to be like, you know, log of the number of points divided by 100. 
or something like that. <clears throat> or sorry, 100 times log of the, the, the number of points. Okay, so that's a good result, and that's you know, uh, very powerful in the sense that this relies nothing it relies on nothing about this point cloud rather than, other than the number of terms in it. Right? And I still get this logarithmic result. It's a very, very powerful thing. Okay. So what do, what, do, uh, uh, what do we want? We're interested in something a little different, but closely related. So we're interested not in some finite set of points, right? What we're interested in is for this sort of bound to hold for uh, all 2s sparse vectors simultaneously. Okay, how many 2s sparse vectors are there? Oh, there's infinity. So I can't just, like, you know, put infinity here and call it a day, right? A log of q is small, but log of infinity is still infinity. So, like, we can need to, we need to be a little more careful. Okay, but actually, you know, we do and we don't. So we do need to be more careful, but it turns out to be pretty easy. So what we can say is like, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to divide this up into to, to, to two parts. So what you say is like, look, you know, I want to uh, look at uh, 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 whether or not this is true for all 2s sparse vectors. What I can think about is just looking at, say, you know, okay, let me just consider the set of all vectors whose sparsity pattern is the same. So they have some fixed support of size 2ns. So then I'm talking about preserving the energy in a 2s dimensional subspace. Uh, so that's, you know, you still have an infinity of vectors, but it turns out there's a very easy way to discretize this problem and that I can, you know, I don't really need to talk about uh, an infinity, this, uh, uh, this concentration for an infinity of vectors. It's enough to do it for a finite subset of an appropriate size. And, you know, we'll talk about what that finite subset is. And then we can say, okay, that will be good for one uh, uh, subspace of dimension 2s, but then I might have many, I have many sub subspaces. Actually, if n choose 2s of these. But that, that turns out to be okay, because that's still like a finite number, and I can just put that into my uh, 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 union bound, and all goes well. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's what we want. So let's start with this. So here is, this is kind of the hard part, uh, the last hard part of, of this discussion. So let's just say, uh, you know, instead of a finite set of points, right, so let's say that V is a 2s dimensional subspace of Rn. And then I want to ask, you know, what's the probability that, that, that phi preserves the energy of everything in V? Right, and so what I can ask is, you know, I can, uh, you know, this again should be uh, x in V, and v, x norm of x should be equal to 1 for this to make sense. I forgot to write that there. But then, you know, what I can ask is, okay, look, you know, and so what I'm saying is I have kind of a result like this for a single vector x. What I'd like is the probability that the supremum over all x, uh, that I'd say are unit norm, so all unit norm vectors in the subspace, uh, the supremum is bigger than delta, is also less than, you know, some e to the minus n. And it turns out uh, we can still do that, but we pay a sort of an exponential factor in x. And this is a, and enough, and again, it's a... a uh, okay, so let's just see how you get a result like this. So we have this main concentration result. So here's what you do. What you do is you say, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I know how to get a result for a finite set of points. It's just our first like, uh, concentration result coupled with uh, just a union bound multiplying the failure probability by the number of points we wanted to hold for. So what we do is we uh, uh, take our sort of continuum of vectors, so all our vectors that have energy less than or equal to one, and we just uh, approximate it by a finite set, right? So, uh, you know, what, sometimes what you do is you, you come up with a code book of resolution epsilon. So it's called an epsilon net or an epsilon cover uh, uh, for the unit ball in BB. So all that is, is, uh, you know, you just uh, 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 say like this collection of points, like some collection of points is an epsilon net for BB if, you know, every point in VB is within epsilon of one of the points in the net, right? So, I'm just drawing it bad because I actually have gaps here. But, <laughs> but if there weren't any gaps, I could basically, okay, look, you know, this guy is within epsilon of that guy. You know, this guy is within epsilon of that guy. This guy is within epsilon of both this guy and this guy. So, it, you know, it gives me uh, 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 some measure of the, you know, what you might call the geometric complexity of this set. 
Okay, uh, now you can ask, okay, just like when you do uh, source coding, you can ask, okay, what's the, you know, what's the average length of the shortest code, right, it's a well-defined question. And in this here, this deterministic setting, if I just give you a geometrical set, I can ask for a fixed epsilon, what's the size of the smallest epsilon of? So that's something called the covering number uh, for BB. So it's really, it's just a strictly geometrical uh, a notion for your, for your set. And not only that, like, you know, these, these are things that come up all the time in, in, in mathematics and approximation theory. So it's very well understood, especially for things like the unit ball in a two-s dimensional subspace, you know, what these look like, uh, what these numbers look like. And in fact, this is what you can say. For a two-s dimensional subspace, I can approximate, I can approximate all the vectors in a two-s dimensional subspace that have norm less than or equal to one. I can approximate it to uh, within epsilon by using this many points. So 1 plus 2 over epsilon to the 2s. So that's like about how many of these little balls I need to, to, to cover this bigger ball uh, uh, somewhere. So I have little balls of radius epsilon and a big ball of radius 1. How, 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 the, how many do I need to cover it? And this is, this is the answer. The important thing here is it looks kind of like 1 over epsilon to the x. Right? It's exponential in s. Uh, or it goes like you know, 1 over epsilon exponential in x. Okay, so that's what we do. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, 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 pair this with an easy result, uh, which I, I'll, spare, I'll spare you the proof of this, but it's again, it's straightforward. So this just, this just comes from the triangle and the following. And what this says is. Uh, you know, it's actually tr uh, true that for, I can, oh, well, I'll, yeah, let's, let's just take this as it says, as, 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 as it's stated here. So I, what I can do, what, I, what you can show at the end of the day, and you actually show something a little more general is, you know, if I'm interested in looking at all the vectors in x in the unit ball and looking at the difference between phi x, x squared minus x, uh, it's actually enough to look at it only over a, a epsilon net if I multiply the result by 1 over 1 minus 2 epsilon. And while I was causing kind of pausing there, it's like there's nothing really special about this function. This type of result is true for any kind of a, a quadratic functional uh, on, on x. Right? So if you have any of like x d a x for any symmetric a, you can write x d a x here and x d a x here. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, it says this, these maybe should be, this should be an x or these should be y. But the point is, is I can replace this optimization program over the entire unit sphere with a with a, 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 uh, uh, with the optimization over just the net if I just pay the factor. Right? So if epsilon is like a, a quarter, right, all I'm doing is paying a factor of two. Right? So really all I need is to do this for uh, a small number of points. Okay, so if I, so then you know obviously if I take uh, 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 epsilon equal to a quarter, right? What do I get? I get 1 plus 8 here, so 9 to the 2s, and I get that I only pay a factor of 2 uh, here, right? And so then what we come up with is this c prime, this gets, a, this gets a, affected by a factor of 2, so it's delta squared, so that factor of 2 becomes a factor of 4, uh, and this is, you know, what I get at the end of the day. So that's, again, this comes from uh, sort of basic uh, 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 you know, what did we use to get this? We used our previous concentration result, which gave us this e to the minus c prime delta squared m, and we just use an approximation of this, this sphere. Okay, so that's good. Uh, and then you can kind of see, like, well, you know, if I want to preserve everything in this subspace, how big does m need to be to make this quantity small? Well, it's basically we can replace this with e to the something times s, Right, so you kind of need n bigger than s, or m to be bigger than like uh, 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 1 over delta squared s for the random matrix to be well conditioned on fixed subspace, uh, which is nice. Right? It means like we don't have to uh, blow up the dimension by too much to, to make sure we're preserving all the energy in the, this subspace. Okay, that's good. So then, you know, now it's easy. So now we just say, uh, 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 look, this is true for one subspace. One 2s dimensional subspace, but this is true for all 2s dimensional subspaces. So how many are there? Well, there's n choose 2s. 
Okay, well, how many is that? That's like uh, e to the 2s times n over, uh, n over s times e to the 2s. This is kind of what that's like. Right, and so then all we got to do is take this guy and put him up there too, and we get our final result. All right, so if I look over all the, uh, you know, if I look over all this whole all set of 2s sparse vectors, uh, and I ask, you know, for every uh, uh, one of those, you know, do I uh, do I preserve the energy? That's the same as asking, you know, let me look over all the NSC sets of size 2s and look at all the vectors in that 2s dimensional subspace. You know, what's the probability that all of those are preserved? This is the same as five preserving the energy of any 2s sparse vector. Well, it looks like this. And what do I need to do to make this manageable? Well, I need n to basically be like s uh, uh, here log n divided n over log n over s uh, divided by delta squared, right? And so that's uh, that's what you do. So I just manipulate this thing out. So you know what I do is I just rewrite this as e to the something. So I read that as e to something. It's like log two for that guy. Two s log n e over two s. That's this guy. All right, 2s log 9 is this guy, and then I just pull that guy on. And now if I, I want to make this, you know, much less than 1, basically I just need to make this guy, this term, bigger than the rest. Basically you need n bigger than 1 over delta square times s log n over s. Okay, so that's good. So that, you know, was a lot. It's good, it's good for you. Uh, but, and, and it was a lot in a different way. Like, you know, again, this was really... Most of this was just basic probability theory, right? We got to, the, uh, and sometimes we get to the johnson lindman strauss lemma, like what do we need to get to that? We needed to know the Markov inequality and like what the, what the moment generating function was for a chi-squared random variable. That got us a lot of leverage, right? And then we just had this minor detail of, well, we don't have a finite set, like we have this, you know, these subspaces and there's an infinite number of vectors in these subspaces. Uh, but then, you know, we have this, way of uh, basically approximating uh, uh, all these vectors by a finite set, right? And that basically we could do it with not too many. So we could get an, accept we could, we could get an acceptable bound on, on, on how phi behaved in a subspace simply by looking at 9 to the 2s, an exponential number of vectors in that space, right? Just by taking epsilon equal to a quarter here, just means we pay a factor of 2. Okay, and so then we have it. There you have it. I mean, there, you know, we have kind of the second pillar. So it's like, you know, if you want to ask two questions about sparse recovery, it's like, well, what do I need out of a matrix phi to be able to recover with L1? That's what we did yesterday. And, you know, what we showed is you need matrices to have uh, this restricted isometry property for 2S sparse vectors. They say, okay, what kind of matrices have restricted isometry property for 2S sparse vectors? Well, random matrices do when their number of rows exceeds s times log n over s, right? So that's the, those are kind of the two uh, you know, sort of cornerstones of sparse recovery in the context of compressed sense. Okay, good. So that's the last super technical uh, lecture. Uh, we'll break uh, now and we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, two other things. So I'm gonna, gonna, how I'm going to finish this, this course is I'm going to talk for a little bit uh, about low rank recovery and uh, sort of quadratic and bilinear problems. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end uh, just about some recent research you've been doing in our group on like dynamic L1 reconstruction. Okay, so let's break until uh, uh, 301. This is 251 now.